in verse number 12. John 15 and 12, Jesus said, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now think about it, as I have loved you. Loved us so much that he left heaven. Came in the form of man and died a horrible death. 13 says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. And then if you'll turn to Luke, the 22nd chapter, starting in verse number 47, it says, And while ye, he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Could there be a greater insult? But Jesus said unto him, Judas, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? I don't know how many were there. We're all 12. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Amen. The evidence was gone. And I wonder if the servant got saved because of the miracle. And then John, the 18th chapter. Starting in verse number 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink? Lord, we ask your blessing on your word. It's nothing without your anointing, God. We want to hear from heaven. We ask that you touch it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning I put the last minute touches on my message. And at 1.32 this afternoon, I changed the message. This could be part two of Brother East's message from this morning. I entitled it Defending Jesus. I can imagine Peter got so excited when the army came to take him that he said, no, you're not going to take my Jesus. I will give up my life for the one I love. I believe all of the disciples except for Judas felt that way. Have you defended Jesus lately? Because we're all going to have to. I remember when my son was about to graduate from high school from a, a Baptist school. We sent him his last couple of years. Um, and uh, there obviously was a difference in doctrine and, and there were some, some challenges just before he was supposed to graduate and go on a uh, school trip, um, I think it was to Washington, D.C., um, after school one day, he drove out of the parking lot and, and squealed his tires. Well, that wasn't good. The next day, he was called into the office, and, and he was asked to bring his father. That'd be me. And they said, because of his behavior, he's not going to go on the school trip. And he was really looking forward to it. And I said to the church board, they were 
all sitting there, I said, you know, I know he did wrong, and he knows he's done wrong, and he's apologized to me, and he'll apologize to you right now for what he did. And they said, well, um, we're still not going to change our mind. And then I read to them Galatians 6 and 1. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Later, all of the parents of the graduating kids called the school and said, listen, if he's not going, our kids aren't going either. They had more mercy than the church board did. We defend who we love. Anybody love their kids? Have you ever defended them? It's our nature, but it's also the nature of God. It's the love of God within us to extend mercy to people. I remember years ago, a lady in our church worked at a public school, and a woman who also worked there had a problem with her doctrine. One day, came up behind her in the office and cut her hair. People had to hold me back because I was so upset. When someone comes after us, you see, there's a righteous indignation that comes about us. This is no, not my people, not my God. You don't understand who you're dealing with. Now, how do you feel God feels when someone comes against his saints? We have all defended someone we love, especially those who couldn't defend themselves, and when people walked away from Jesus because he said some hard things, he said, well, are you going to walk away from me also? And they said, where are we going to go? You're the one who have the words of life. You know, from time to time, we're all going to be offended by something, but where are we going to go? You see? Every time a prayer band goes out, we're standing in the gap for people that we love. We care about them. We care about each and every one of the people within God's church. Most wars have been fought to defend country and people that they love, such as Ukraine right now. You know, Russia didn't understand the resolve of the people of Ukraine, that they loved their country and loved their people, which is much more powerful than any of the weapons that Russia could use. David says, is there not a cause before he went up against the giant? He said, how can you not do something to defend your God? In the name of the Lord, I come in the name of the Lord. Church, we have a cause bigger than ourselves. We come against sickness and attacks from the enemy in each of our lives from time to time. When a prayer request goes out, we, because of our love, we go on the defense of those that are hurt. It's what the church does. I've defended people I love in this church as Jesus has come to my rescue over and over and over again. And when someone comes with an accusation... You know what? I'm going to defend the person I love. I don't know all of the the information. And that just comes natural with the love of God. But have you ever considered that we, like Peter, might have to defend God, that we might need to safeguard our God? an all-powerful God, an almighty God, omnipotent God, unlimited in authority, and we, just little old me, has to defend Jesus like Peter defended Jesus. Peter felt that, that way in the garden that night. He was so in love with his God. He was so enamored by his God. He was willing to fight and even lose his life in order to defend his God. 
after Peter cut off the ear of the soldier, Jesus told Peter, put up your sword into the sheath. But I can't help to wonder if there wasn't just a little smile on the face of Jesus because somebody defended him against the enemy. And every time we have to defend this book, every time we have to defend our principles, every time we defend our holiness stand, our oneness of God, I wonder if there is a little smile from God that says, thank you. I can handle this, but thank you. Hallelujah. Of course, it was the wrong thing to do, and Jesus fixed the ear, perhaps maybe saved the life of this servant, but Peter took a stand for the one that he loved. He demonstrated that he would defend and vindicate his God. I'm afraid we're getting to the place where we just don't defend what we believe like we used to. I was saying something to someone this morning. I said, you know, I'm afraid of the third and fourth generation in this truth because they didn't pay the same price that I paid or some of you paid because when we came into the church, we were attacked mercilessly. All of the things that were said against us and it caused us to take a stand for the one that we loved. But now, the truth comes a lot easier and we're not defending like we had to defend before. Every one of the apostles died a horrible death. They could have denounced Jesus, but no, they stood, they stand. Church, there is a hardly a day that goes by when we don't face some kind of challenge. This whole world comes to take away our Jesus. Even to this day, they want to crucify him over and over, slap his face, put a crown of thorns on his head, proclaim he's a liar, and his word has absolutely no value. And, and I've been guilty as, as many of just saying nothing while others declare that we don't have the right doctrine or we're gone overboard. 2,000 Years have not changed a whole lot. They're still coming to take our Jesus. Jesus betrayed by a kiss, and, and people wanted to put him on trial. They're wanting to put him on trial every day, put his word on trial every day, put our, our commitment to God on trial every day. It's, it's all a made-up story according to them, and, and, and it's just a book that was written by men. It's not something that we have to defend. So do we have any Peters here tonight? Anybody? Anybody? It puts us at risk. Are you willing to draw your sword and vindicate our Jesus, exonerate him from the false accusations I'll tell you one thing Jesus won't say as we pick up our sword. He won't say, put it down. Not anymore. Now he's saying, pick up your sword. Defend me, will you? I'm not here anymore, but you're here to defend me, to defend my word, to defend why I died for you every day. We are to use our sword to defend Jesus. He, he licensed each of us for concealed carry. We now have it on our phone. We have it in six or seven Bibles that we ha each have, not only to carry our Bibles, but to carry the sword of the Spirit with us in order to defend. It's not my opinion. Here, do you want to see what it says in the Word of God? This is why I believe the way I believe. This is how we defend our God. If you'll turn to Ephesians, familiar scripture, the sixth chapter, starting in verse number 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole army of, armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
If we could just get that through our mind. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, personalities and problems, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all this all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that the utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. Will anyone defend Jesus? Church, we need to defend what we know to be true. I know that we need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. It's not an outward evidence of an inner work. It's, it's not something that isn't a part of salvation. It is salvation. We need to be filled with his spirit, speaking with the evidence of tongues. Our modesty, our oneness of God, our faithfulness to the house of God, our sobriety, our abstinence, all of these things are vital to our salvation. As we heard this morning from Brother East, Paul said it this way in Romans 1 and 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And every time we defend our God, more power. Hallelujah. And there's a smile on our God's face. Hallelujah. See, this whole world rejects him, but there's someone who has to stand with him at all costs. So what caused Peter to be so bold to draw his sword and defend Jesus, surrounded by all these enemies, he, he himself could have forfeited his life by taking that stand. You, you may forfeit a friendship. You may forfeit some people who no longer want to spend time with you. But it causes Jesus to actually come closer. If you'll turn to Acts the fourth chapter, in verse number 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The reason that Peter was so bold is because he spent a lot of time with Jesus. I don't know if I could I witness to these people just spend a little more time with Jesus. You'll want to open your mouth. There'll be some things that will be so irritating to you that, that you know you have to correct them because you spent some time with Jesus. Not only that night in the garden, but all the way to his own cross, he defended Jesus because he could have denied Jesus at the very last time instead of being crucified himself. It's because he spent this time with the one he loved. Hear me, if we want to be bold for God, defend our doctrine and our God, then we have to spend more time with Jesus. More time in prayer more time in his house, more time with his people, and using the sword 
to meet every challenge that we have because when the devil came to Jesus, he said, it is written. He used the sword. We can use the sword of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And get the victory. Because if we won't spend time with Jesus, we ourselves may be taken captive as he was taken captive. We become who we spend time with. Their likes become our likes. We must guard who we are in our relationship with Jesus because it can easily be taken from us. Hallelujah. One time, you, de- you don't defend who you are. And the next time, it's easier not to defend who you are. It's easier just to say nothing instead of defending who you are and our God. Turn to 2 Timothy, if you would. Chapter 1 or verse number 8. It says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. There's going to be some affliction involved in standing for something that this whole world will not stand for. And then if you'll turn to Mark, the 8th chapter. Verse 38. Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Hallelujah. Take people out of a day-to-day relationship with God, and we all become cowards. We get to the place where we, we fall back and won't defend what God has put us on this earth to defend. Why would he keep us here after we're filled with the Holy Ghost except to proclaim to this generation, thank God somebody opened their mouth that I could be standing here tonight. Hallelujah. We have to stand for what we believe, but more so stand for the God who gave us his salvation. My old pastor used to say this all the time, if you aren't standing for something, you're falling for everything. Hallelujah. I wonder how many people lost salvation just because they wouldn't take a stand in one area of their life and then the next area and then the next area. This nation is starving for someone to to stand up and declare, I defend our nation's constitution with all its rights and liberties for every individual. Even today, people won't stand for the thing that causes this nation to be so prosperous. I'll defend it even if the majority will not, whether it's popular or whether it's not. We have to get to the place where we understand that the principles of God are more important than the popularity of people. Because I am a proud citizen of the United States of America. Those who don't feel that way have a right to move. But they won't. Because they're getting the blessings of a nation who was founded on the principles of God. Why are so many people who criticize this nation wanting to come to this nation? Isn't it amazing? A nation of so few people in comparison to so many other people in the world, but we have so much blessings and freedoms and riches because we're standing on the Word of God. I got my citizenship papers when I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and and then came under the framework of another constitution called the Word of God. And, and it's not determined by a vote or popularity. It's a declaration of independence for each and every one of us. I pledge allegiance to all of it because it is what saved me and it's what will keep me saved. 
For there are many who say it's their constitution as well, but will argue that portions of it are non-relevant to today, or they dissect it and question its validity as if they know more than the one who authored it. How can we question the framework of Christianity when God himself wrote it for our benefit, not in order to take our liberty from us, but to give us liberty because of that framework? Generally, when people don't want to follow the God-given constitution, it's because it puts restraints on their lifestyle. So they look for a Philadelphia lawyer who, who can change God-given law. You know, it's, it's not that important anymore. Or find a Bible scholar coming out of the cemetery who has never had a, a salvational experience, and they're telling you what is important, to tell them those scriptures were for times past or, or are not relevant for today. The Supreme Court has now overruled the word of God. No, church. There is nothing wrong or outdated about the Word of God. It is irrelevant for each and every one of us today and every day. The problem is with those who are to protect the Word of God from corruption and their unscrupulous frauds who bend it and twist it and water it down to the point where it doesn't have any effect or power. God said in Malachi 3 and 6, For I am the Lord and I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His law still apply to us and the blessings because of obedience to the law are there. God doesn't care how many people water down or dilute his word. It still will judge each and every one of us whether we know it or we don't know it. And that's why it's so important to get to people to tell them there's a plan for your life. When that happened in my life, perhaps in yours too, I wasn't excited about listening because I didn't want restrictions. But God puts a, a will within us to conform to his word. And he takes out the stony heart and puts a heart of flesh in us and causes us to want to walk in his statutes and, and love his word. If we find a resistance, then we know there's something wrong with our spirit. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 3. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all towards each other abound, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecution and tribulation that ye endure, which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also, no, suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and who obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that could have been us. Didn't know the truth, or we could have heard the truth and did nothing about it. Listen, church, it seems that there are less and less who are standing up and defending God's constitution. People are, are blessed when they defend the word of God and, and not acquiesce or give in to the crowds, not change, not hide. We're not Christians incognito. You know, one day we stand up for, it's so easy to stand up for, for God in church, but outside these walls, all of a sudden, mm, not so easy. God is saying in these end times, who will stand up and defend my word? Some pastors won't because they're afraid they may lose people. It's just the opposite. When we stand up for the word of God, God adds to the church such as should be saved. We, we can do all we want in order to attract people, but God is the only one who can keep people, can keep the church, you see. Hallelujah. It's not because of a message that has been preached. It's not because of, uh, of the singing or our music. It's because of our relationship. It's because of a testimony. It's because something miraculous as the children sang. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's more than one, two, three, or four. It's miracles that are happening every day in our life, and that's what keeps us. I'm willing to defend and stand up for the word of God regardless of what the crowd say, regardless of what some religious leaders say, regardless of what the Supreme Court says. Because John 12 and 48 says this, the words of Jesus, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last days. We're defending what saves us. I've been around for a while. I've seen churches come, and I've seen churches go. I've seen great preachers come, and great preachers go. I've seen singing groups who had talent, who ministered under the Holy Ghost, one day minister under their own talents and eventually lose out with God. Because we have to stay with what saved us and what anoints us. I'm going to stay with the book. What other criteria, what other gauge, what other yardstick what benchmark to go by? It certainly isn't going to be the opinion of others. I, I've seen churches get to the place where they said, you know what, we're just going to back off this holiness thing for a little while. We'll get, maybe we'll come back to it later, but we, just, we need to attract those who are just a little bit afraid of, of standards, you see. And God's saying in Romans, the first chapter, you cannot have righteousness without holiness. He's saying, if you want to deviate from the word of God, give me back the truth. You don't deserve it. In Acts 2 and 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So who's responsible? Whose responsibility is it to defend God's constitution? Is it, is it just a few pastors? No, it's each and every one of us to defend it on a daily basis or one day someone is going to take it from us. I love God's word, and Jesus is the word made flesh. No, you're not taking my Jesus. <laughs> I'll take up the sword. You're not taking my Jesus. Hold it, keep it, 
and defend it with everything you have. Now is not a time to back away from the principles of the word of God because we are defending our God just like Peter defended Jesus in that garden. God smiles when he sees someone standing for the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a separation. There's something about when we stand up against what the world and even other denominations believe that God's saying, yes, that's, that's my church. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? There's a lot of promises in this book, but the only way you can have access to them is to be obedient to God's word. And it could be frustrating to ask God for things that he's never going to give us because we have decided there are some things that we're not going to stand for. But it's time to pull out all of the stops. Time to get to a place where God, I want everything that you have promised for us. Amen. Hallelujah. And God will. He will. Hallelujah. The altar's open. Would you come?